Okay, thank you. All right, so this panel is going to be specifically looking now at climate tech. Earlier on, we spoke about agriculture. Um, if we look at the urgency of climate change, every year is hotter than the year before. And in the last um, just decade alone, we've had the 10 most warm years um, in terms of climate change. So we will hand over to Andrew, who will be moderating this panel. Um, yeah, over to you, Andrew. We'll just hold on for a quick second. Okay, everyone who is a coffee, I feel like a school teacher when I have to do this. Sorry, there you go, got through. Okay, great. Now over to you, Andrew. Cool. Thank you. Can you hear me? Is this on? Yeah? Cool. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, really, really great to be here. The fact that we're running a couple of minutes behind and I have a flight to catch at 6 p.m. is not lost on me, so we're going to dive straight in. I'm really excited for this panel. Um, we've got an excellent lineup of people. Um, given that we are a little time constrained, intro, please. One line about where you're from and uh, what you're excited about. Geraldine. Thank you. My name is uh, Geraldine Pandanyama. I'm the founder and managing partner of Darena Ventures. Um, we are a startup advisory firm for climate tech startups in sub-Saharan Africa, but we are also launching a growth fund. Cool. Uh, Tahir, I'm a partner at Savant. We are a group of companies, but today I'm wearing our fund hat. And we've got one fund down, and we're going into our green economy uh, fund two now, uh, Series A companies. Um, so I mean, that's, that's the perspective we bring today. Hi, everyone. Maxime. I'm an operating partner with Catalyst Fund. We are um, a climate tech, Africa-focused, early-stage investor, and also the co-founder of Africa The Big Deal, where we track uh, uh, startup funding in Africa. Hey, everyone. Josh, uh, founder and CEO of Holocene. Uh, African early stage climate VC and venture builders, so generally investing between 100 and 200,000 US dollars, split between cash and services, pre seed climate tech in Africa. Hi everyone, Priyash, co founder of the Awareness Company. We're a startup, data and AI for sustainability across energy, water, agriculture, buildings, and critical infrastructure. Great, so you can see we've got a diverse panel, a lot of really interesting views. E3 Capital, uh, we're an early stage Pan-Africa climate tech venture fund uh, investing across the continent, seed to, to, pre, well, seed to Series A, I guess, is where we, is where we like to play. Um, so as, the, as our uh, topic dictates, state of climate tech, um, very popular these days, a lot of funds being raised. Um, Second across the continent last year by, by, deal, by deal value, I think about $860 million. Traditionally dominated by energy and energy access, but we are starting to see uh, some new verticals emerging, some intersection between what have been traditionally siloed, uh, I guess, investment themes across the continent. So I think the first question to the whole panel, given that you know, this, is, this is quite a big and popular and, and diverse topic, uh, across a variety of different funds that are, that are being raised. From, from your particular perspective, how do you think about, let's call it Climate Tech 2.0, the next sort of five to 10 years of this, of this decade of climate investing? Uh, maybe we can start uh, with our operator at the end. Uh, firstly, I love that you're calling a startup operator. I'm gonna start calling myself an operator. It's, it's really nice. Um, climate 1.0, energy, agriculture. Climate 2.0 is bringing in sort of all the other aspects that's been left out. And what's interesting is the reasons for it. You know, is it policy change? Is it consumer pressure? Is it businesses now want to take this more seriously? And so that's making us look at things outside of, but including energy and ag. So I think now there's this whole convergence of a perfect storm that's coming unless we do something about it. And I think that's driving the definition of climate 2.0. Yeah, maybe just to add, so um, I, I was part of Climate Tech 1.0 and EAV, which is now E3, was on our, one of our investors in that first wave. And what that first wave did a great job of doing was capitalizing sector, starting to be able to build business models that made some sense. Like this was a sector within Pago Solar that did attract $2 billion. I think what we missed though, well, again, what it also did was seed other sectors like EV, clean cooking, cold storage, all these things that are happening now did not happen before that Pago Solar. Um, maybe just speaking, everyone sees the world through their own glasses, right? I was a CFO and I think the thing that we missed in that first wave and all the pitches that you heard earlier 
need blended capital. How do you use grants to get some level of product market fit, to test your commercial? How do you use debt to cover some of the capex in these business models? I always say software loves electrons, climate tech loves atoms. So how do you fund hardware smartly and get investors the return profile they need? Capital is flowing. This will be the first year in African climate tech history, maybe Maxime can talk about this a bit because he's got all the data, where we believe that climate tech will attract more venture capital than fintech. That's a big deal. So there's capital flowing, but how do we make sure that capital gets the return profile it needs to stick around and to raise more funds and to continue to galvanize the sector? Yeah, so I can confirm that, yeah, hopefully we're on track to, for that. I think at the moment uh, it's about one in four dollars invested in, in the continent so far in 2024 that went to, um, to startups in the climate tech space, so definitely super encouraging. Um, maybe to take a slightly different stand on, you know, what we define as the, the, the next generation of climate tech, for us, it's really all about climate adaptation. So, um, you know, as a continent, Africa generates three to four percent of CO2 emissions globally. Um, yet, it's the, con the continent the most affected by climate change uh, on a daily basis. This is already happening. We're not talking about 10 years from now, 20 years from now. We're talking about now. You know, uh, heat waves, floods, droughts. This is already a reality for several parts of this continent on a, on a daily basis. And so. We as Catalyst Fund really focus on, on, on that part, so climate adaptation. How do we help this continent and, and people across the continent to be more resilient and adapted to climate change? Um, I think that's what we're excited about. Yeah, so uh, climate 1.0, I don't know where it starts, where it ends, where climate 2.0 does start, but um, we've been around for about 20 years looking at uh, technology, we've been technology driven, looking at companies that solve sort of real tangible problems. And a lot of the time in doing that, you know, uh, we veered away from a lot of software um, only solutions. So back in the day, we were looking at things like machinery doing deep soil, um, you know, churning and those sorts of things to uh, help with agriculture. Um, we looked at, uh, what do you call this, uh, industrial wastewater treatment, you know, um, we looked at concentrated uh, solar power as well as a solution. Um, and we've done that over the years, but as, you know, networking and infrastructure from that perspective has started to grow, we've actually started seeing a shift from being pure, okay, here's a CapEx or specifically just a device that stands on its own to, you know, there's a blend between software and hardware, you know, so IoT is really, that fourth industrial revolution has actually changed the types of businesses that we're starting to look at. And there's a lot more data being collected now reliably, efficiently, in real time. And that's also in turn changing the types of solutions that's coming out, you know. So we are now able to have a lot more AI-driven solutions, you know, um, sometimes just pure ML. Uh, but, yeah, so I think for me, at least now, there's a progression to a more digitized and an integrated hardware, software sort of environment in the climate tech space. Uh, but where it goes beyond that, yeah, we'll see. Um, so, to me, uh, Climate uh, 1.0 was a very complicated um, sector. It um, confused a lot of people because they would constantly ask, what is climate tech? Um, and the layman, the person on the street has got no clue what is climate tech. But Climate um, 2.0 is very simplified. It's basically anything and everything that helps people to adapt to the effects of climate change. So, it's more broad. Um, it's, it's, it, it stretches from supply chain management in, a, in an environmentally friendly way. It, it goes as far as supplying food, providing food to alleviate hunger, um, and everything done in an environmentally sustainable way. So that's it's simplified. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've certainly seen a, an increase in, in the number of dedicated funds from a climate perspective that and African dedicated funds that are that are that are, are raising capital across the, the the continent from the likes of of Novastar, uh, AGG, Catalyst, E3, who are, are raising quite significant um, funds. Maybe Maxim, sticking with you, and it, it, given the, the kinds of data that you're looking at, I mean, what do you think is driving some of this new renewed interest from a global macros perspective, consumer consciousness? You spoke about terms like climate resilience, adaptation, and then I think maybe as a segue, where do you see some of the learnings that we've had over the last 10 years, you know, that, that need to be in, in let's say, Climate Tech 2.0 um, to, 
to satisfy what, what investors are now looking for? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky one. I mean, the, the immediate, you know, obvious answer that comes to mind is just, you know, basically looking at what's going on with the, with the weather. I guess it's a, a good reminder on a daily basis that, uh, you know, we need to act on, on, this, on this issue. The other thing that comes to mind is the fact that historically, startups in the continent uh, have always been addressing big problems. You know, we're not talking about convenience solution. We're talking about, you know, primary needs kind of solutions, you know, energy access. Healthcare access, education access. Um, now, climate change is the biggest problem we have, um, and so I'm not surprised that an increasing number of, of entrepreneurs in this continent are tackling this problem because there's always been this history of tackling massive uh, problems. Now, as this was said earlier, in terms of you know where we have gone from the past couple of years, definitely you know we're going from like climate tech being almost only just about energy and in a nutshell, you know, solar energy, to you know diversifying a lot more to different solutions, you know. Uh, we have seen large companies, I mean, large startups actually raise significant rounds just in the past couple of weeks. We can talk about Pula doing insurance for crops in East Africa. We can talk about Sun Culture doing access to and replacing diesel water pumps by solar powered water pumps. You know, these kind of models are, are emerging and are completely, you know, falling within what we call the, the, the second generation of climate tech. And, and that's the kind of model that I think we're going to see more and more in the coming years. Yeah, no, I. I certainly agree. I agree with that. And maybe changing tack slightly, um, you know, one of the themes that we we all attend the same conferences, you know, every year, and uh, and one of the themes that's coming up now, given where we are in the let's say the VC ecosystem, is liquidity. Like, where is it coming? Where is it? You know, when is it coming? In what sectors is it is it coming to? Um, when I think about all of the pitch decks, we we look at the likes that, that, that you guys look at as well. You, you know, the the, the truly scaled Pan African story. I'm perfectly frank, hasn't really materialized as much as we would have liked it to, right? And maybe outside of fintech, because there's some sort of banking and finance infrastructure that's there that allows some scale. Um, do you think there's something about uh, this new wave of climate tech where we can take some of those learnings and, and push them into our portfolio companies, uh, work with our, well, with our operators, uh, if that's what you prefer to be called, uh, to, to try and really think about how we can take these solutions and, and, and scale them, not only in an African context, but, but truly globally, given, as you say, the nature of these problems are actually global problems. Maybe, Josh, if you've got some Yeah, for sure. Um, and I appreciate talking about adaptation, and, and, and I want to poke a little bit at mitigation as well, so think about this thing a bit differently. So uh, I think a lesson is we all have to do a bunch of stuff, and if you're focusing on X, I can focus on Y and be additive, but what we also want to think about is VC loves inventing new things, right? Everyone in this room today, if you're a VC and you've been trying to raise capital for a while, how easy has it been? It's really hard, right? Why do we do this? Because we love inventing the future and trying to bring the present to a better future, right? So here's two concepts maybe on the mitigation side that I th we think are really big and really interesting. One is, I believe, and, and Home is a, an E3 portfolio company, um, solar marketplace. So six gigawatts of solar have been installed in South Africa over the last two years. So the equivalent of six fossil fuel power plants have been installed on rooftops. Why? Not because people all of a sudden care about climate, but because they're tired of load shedding, right? Because I have perishable goods I can't have go bad. So that idea that Southern Africa could be the first place in the world where people produce and consume electricity in the same spot and get paid to do so. So that's mitigating because ESCOM is one of the, is the highest, so as everyone's sitting in this room today, we're the largest carbon emitters in Africa per capita, period. Southern Africa is heavily industrialized with a super dirty grid. So right, what if we get rid of transmission, get rid of that, that inefficient process of creating a centralized fossil fuel grid, get rid of all that and do it at the home level. That's mitigation, that's venture capital, right? Virtual power plants, rooftop solar, these are things that venture capital can fund, especially if there's debt in the capital, in, in the capital structure. So getting a CFO early is great. Another cool one, and again, I just wanna plant some seeds for all the innovators in the room, uh, 40% of the world's population will be in Africa in the next 50 years. The three biggest cities in the world will be Lagos, Dar, and Kinshasa. 70% of the buildings in Africa have yet to be built. So if you're gonna do stuff in Europe, you have to retrofit. Those things weren't built to be climate efficient. You're gonna retrofit everything. We can build right from day one. That's mitigation, right? That's, t that's tech, that's biotech, that's interesting stuff. So I think this next wave has to specialize more because these things are super complicated. So let's all start to specialize. Let's all share experiences. Let's think about adaptation and mitigation. Let's think differently, because VC has to be different. 
Let's all try to do different stuff. And the last piece, and maybe I can turn it over to our operator here, and is a portfolio company now policy, which I'm proud to say. Um, finding really super passionate people who are solving this problem with a value proposition, with a very clear value proposition to a customer who still does not care about climate, but cares about bottom line. So maybe I can take Andrew's role and send it back over this way a little bit. Look, there has to be the commercial side to this. It can't be the soft, fluffy thing that we're chasing, right? The way we define, back to your first question, sustainability, we actually talk about sustainability, not climate, not green economy, it's sustainability. And what is our definition of sustainability? It's planet, people, and profit. Those are three equal things. We have to build in that way. To your point about the Pan-African lessons and you know, coming back, the way I'm seeing it as well, if you think about FinTech, you can create a localized FinTech economy serving specific markets in Africa. The thing about climate tech is that because you're in Africa, it still affects the global supply chain. The supply chains for climate tech are global. You farm in Africa, you export to the UK. Now suddenly the impact is real time internationally. So that means this is not just Africa's problem, it's a global problem. And if we put that hat on with the commercial hat, planet, people, profit, I'm gonna repeat this a thousand times, then I think we'll be on the right track. You know, I think as, as, uh, as VCs as well, we love, we love a good buzzword. Um, two of the big climate buzzwords, at least, that, that we're looking at at the moment is uh, AI and carbon. Um, and so maybe turning to some of our, our deep tech uh, minds here, to Josh's point earlier, um, I think the first time and probably the only time I heard the built environment being used was when I was at UCT and it was a faculty that I had no idea about, right? But now suddenly, you know, you have these prop tech companies that are doing a whole lot of interesting work. You've got some data companies that are doing a whole lot of interesting work where there is this intersection of what were traditionally siloed uh, verticals now starting to, to play in a, in a holistic climate space, right? And so from an AI perspective, you know, we, apart from it just being a, a cool acronym that are in a lot of pitch decks today, there really are some companies that are building some solutions. And so maybe from, from your perspective today, as a traditionally a deep tech investor, how are you seeing this intersection now Kind of come together between what was, you know, would have been climate and energy, and now with artificial intelligence and technology. Yeah, I mean, it all boils down to, um, you know, being able to make decisions, right? Uh, that's at least that's what it is for me on the surface, right? So that's helped bring together that divide of what you say is the built environment and now sort of this AI play, um, but it's, it's just. It's really difficult to have real change um, without actually tackling the built environment. Um, and when it comes to AI specifically, you know, it's not necessarily that all these startups are AI startups. You know, some of them actually they're claiming AI, but what's actually happening is AI in maybe content formulation, but it's not necessarily AI powering the devices. So if you separate those things, um, you know, um, you'll start to see that um, you don't necessarily always need AI. So we've got a company in our portfolio, as an example. They they've integrated with uh, two global players um, to deliver their solution. Um, one tackling a different region, one tackling another region. Um, and they're actually able to open, optimize growth environments for particular crop types. And they're not necessarily using AI for that, they're using ML. But the thing that powers the, the ability to do ML is the data. So they first had to find a way to get the technology in the ground or on the ground to be able to gather the data. Um, then they had to find a way to become agnostic across different technologies that's already on the ground then gather that information and turn that into a solution that somebody is actually willing to pay for on an ongoing basis in multiple territories. Uh, so it's, yeah, for me, a lot of it just boils down to data and how you're using that data to power decision making for uh, better solutions. Uh, that's a bit more long lasting. That can at least help you survive that climate change, you know, adapt to different ways of doing things. Yeah. I hope that answers the question. Right? <laughs> And then maybe, maybe, do you want to go, go ahead, Josh? No, no, it's fine. <laughs> well, 
Um, maybe in, in, a, in a kind of similar vein, right? The carbon markets have got a lot of uh, interest, a lot of traction, uh, particularly in, in at least our parts of the world, East Africa. Um, maybe, Priyash, from, from your perspective, um, do you see this as, as an entrepreneur who's building a business where this may or may become a piece of your financing play in the future? I mean, do you see this as an opportunity? How do you think about the, the risks around? And then maybe I'll jump to you, Geraldine, given that you're kind of building the ecosystem, working with a lot of companies. Are you starting to see this becoming a part of the, the way some of your early stage ventures are, are thinking about it as well? Fresh. Yeah, look, I'll repeat a little bit here. The commercial model for climate is unknown. And I like thinking about it like how FinTech is. Like I can explain a FinTech company in about three seconds. You know, there's a company providing access, transactional, we take 2% of this, boom, done. It needs to be that simple. Can carbon now be that thing? I'm not entirely convinced it's the thing to track. I'm not entirely, but is it a piece of the puzzle? Definitely. It can't be facetious because the risk is how do we audit that? Uh, and now this is a long game. If you're an agri company or you're a farmer that wants to now do regenerative practices and you start implementing that, you're only actually going to know if it's working 12 months minimum. It's actually a five-year cycle that you've got to track. So that means carbon has a place to play. And what I'm excited about is actually using that from a behavioral change perspective across energy, agriculture, buildings, and so forth. And what I mean by that is people need to be incentivized. That's where the carbon credit aspect can come in. Give me the incentive to change my behavior on the ground, and cool, then we'll start seeing a bigger shift. Risks in terms of the VC landscape, I mean, as an operator, how I can look at it is they will need to be a combination of the debt and the patient's capital. Like saying, you know what, you need to 10x your revenue in the next six months, but you're waiting for that farmer to then offset his emissions, something needs to change there. Okay, um, so our experience as far as the carbon uh, markets is concerned is the founders uh, generally don't know about the opportunities that are available to them. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't really quite agree. Um, I, I feel there's actually quite a lot of opportunity available in the carbon uh, markets. Um, in fact, for innovators, there is an opportunity there to come up with solutions to address some of what you've um, highlighted as a problem. Um, beside, after all, successful entrepreneurs succeed because they are providing solutions to an existing problem. So what we have actually been doing um, with the startups that we are advising, uh, we are actually encouraging them to, to explore um, carbon markets. Um, and we are finding that startups that are in the agriculture sector, startups that are in the reforestation sector, are actually starting to tap into some of these op uh, opportunities. Um, of recently, we had a, a, a startup um, that's in the biochar sector in Zimbabwe that um, introduced carbon offsets as uh, an extra income generating uh, project for them. So I, I strongly believe there's actually quite a lot of opportunities there. It's an untapped sector uh, as far as involvement of um, African-based uh, companies and there's definitely room. If I can just, just bounce back on one point that was made by, by Priyash just now, which I think is quite important because, you know, a lot of the models that come across uh, us, a lot of pitch decks and so on, there's always a question, you know, is this VC backable? And I think this applies to a lot of the climate tech right now, especially when there's, you know, nature-based solution or like it's a little bit more asset savvy and so on. There's always this question, is it going to be VC backable? Um, you know, our answer is that in a lot of cases, yes, it is VC backable. We just need to maybe change the parting a little bit. I mean, if it's clear if your VC fund is five years or seven years, uh, it's going to be a little bit tricky to get return on the on, on the investment uh, if you invest in a nature based solution that does, for instance, land restoration. Because yes, nature takes time, um, but there's an opportunity maybe for VCs and LPs together to to change a little bit and move towards longer longer time fund. 10 years, 12 years, be a little bit more patient on that front. But with, if that changes, I do think that a lot of these models are actually VC backable. It also needs to. Me it also means that you know it's not, not going to all come from from VCs. I mean, especially if you're raising for I don't know machineries or or building you know assets and so on, you will need some debt. You need some early stage debt as well, which today is a little bit missing. Um, and so yes, there is a change here. It's not going to be just uh, the same kind of ride as as a as fintech, not just all the way up to the right. 
Uh, there's going to be some, 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 some change needed there, but I do think that this is VC backable as long as our industry is ready to adapt to that as well. Can I add a little yeah, bit? Please. Cool, cool. Just to build on this, I think looking at carbon, there's, there are projects, so project finance, nature-based solutions, big regenerative agriculture projects that frankly like, are probably going to be funded by banks or project finance or donors or Conservation International. That's great. They should. There's VC elements on and around that. If it's digital MRV, if it's software to help with logistics, if it's supply chain, if it's, there's a ton of high impact VC assets that can be created around all this more bank project finance capital that's happening. And that's wonderful. Because again, those are electrons, not atoms. The other side is the business model aspect. So in the global north, if, you wanna, if you're a farmer and you want to move to regenerative agriculture, you're going to lose your farm over the next three years. The UK government has stepped in and said, cool, we'll subsidize that transition. If you want to buy an EV, it's going to be more expensive and kind of a pain in the butt for a little while. We'll, we'll as a government, finance that transition. That's not going to happen in Africa. Like Governments don't have enough money to fund that. The way I look at carbon from a business model perspective is a market-based subsidy for a good business model. Like, I wouldn't build a business model around carbon personally, but even in the off-grid solar sector, man, I looked at that business model a million times till Tuesday, and I needed a subsidy. I could not get to profitability, but the market wouldn't, the government wouldn't allow it, donors weren't going to give it. We needed a carbon. We needed that carbon subsidy to be in there for a good business model to drive us to profitability. It's another note in the, in the model is the way I look at it, at least. Can I just, on VC backable and, you know, having different types of business models, so we've got a business in our portfolio that um, last year did about a million dollars. Um, this year they're going to do five, right? Um, uh, we, you know, stakeholders basically said to us, don't invest in this business. Uh, it's manufacturing. It's going to be a private equity multiple. It's not going to be great. But what they did was they started leveraging their data and their technology a little bit better. They won a blue chip uh, contract, and that fundamentally transformed the business. They now have a significant chunk of their business coming from the recurring revenue that's coming out of this um, uh, blue chip contract. And on top of that, they have the ability to now add carbon credits, you know, uh, or the benefit of that on top of it, which makes it even more attractive, you know. So they've already done a steep jump just by doing a slight shift or, or, or adding a little bit of digitization to what they're actually selling. But, you know, if they add a layer of carbon credits on top of that, this thing goes through the roof, right? Because if you look at what's happening in the carbon credit environment, people are actually paying five years up front. You know, you're getting multi-million dollar contracts up front and you just have to deploy whatever it is that you've been deploying. You know, so that's a, a great opportunity, I think. Yeah. And I think that's, that's kind of a really good segue into, into thinking about the fundraise environment, right? We've, not only with the kind of climate dedicated, the African climate dedicated funds that we've seen, we've also started to see a lot more specialist international funds that are once again looking at Africa, right? The likes of people like World Fund, who've just closed a $300 million climate specific fund out of Europe. You've got Toyota Ventures, I think it was north of two, 200 as well. Um, I guess maybe a question for, for, for anyone, but maybe starting with, with you, Geraldine, given what you've seen from the, from the debt side, how, how do we see the ecosystem playing out from a fundraise perspective with some of these new funds coming in. I mean, I, in, I, I'd say in our view, we, I think as, as capital allocators, we need to be cognizant of some of the mistakes we made, maybe inflating valuation over the last 10 years and, and screwing up some of the, the, the capital stacks. Um, so yeah, kind of really interested in everyone's thoughts around uh, how we can redo this, given that there does seem to be a lot of capital that's now moving towards us, and do we have an opportunity to kind of correct course, as it were, and set ourselves up for the next 10 years so we can really achieve some of those returns that we've all modeled out a thousand times in our, in our portfolio models? Okay, um, I think Priyash and, and, and Maxim uh, sort of touched on this. Um, it's very important for investors that are coming into the climate uh, tech space to be a broad range of investors and not just VCs. Um, you find that uh, some of the, the startups that um, are actually solving the climate change crisis, because that's what we are all about, um, they are not really VC-backable startups. So they would do very, very well if they have a debt investor. Um, and even some of the startups that uh, we, we are working with and some of the startups we see are not looking for equity investments. Some of them are not really keen on on um, parting with their equity and they're very happy uh, with, with uh, getting a debt financing. And also it's because of, uh, in some cases, it's because of the nature of the businesses that they are in. 
um, you, you're getting a lot of uh, hardware type of uh, companies that are falling into this sector. Um, so debt would be the most suitable for them. Um, yeah. So I really think uh, it would be really important if we have like a broad range. And my, my word to, to these uh, big uh, foreign investors that are coming onto the continent, if you really want to succeed, uh, partner with local investors um, so that you avoid making the mistakes that were made in the past by foreign investors who came and invested in, in businesses that they didn't understand. Um, there are local players on the continent who are really able to actually help you to succeed. I mean, you're seeing it on the stage today. So Savant has their build program. Catalyst does a ton of human capital services. So does Holocene. So I think what you're seeing is if you're raising a 200, 300 million dollar fund, you're writing, or even a, what are you guys, 75 now? You need to write checks. You need to write big checks and you can't do all the ESO work. You can't do all the heavy lifting. That's not your job anyway. It's financial capital. So for these big checks coming in, you do have a number of ecosystem partners at more of like the pre-seed, more bootstrap pre-seed area that are providing services to these startups. Because I think the second wave is realizing you can't solve the problem with two or three people. Like if you have a really good data scientist and you have uh, maybe a commercial person, you still need a CFO, but you can't afford them. Or you still need to figure out carbon, which is super complicated and very technical, and you don't have that person on your team. So I think the market is correcting for that. The one thing I would throw out there is that we need to rethink the two and 20 model. It makes no sense, right? ESOs are gonna be, like it might cost me $250,000 a year of services or of human capital to invest 500K. So now you're talking about two to one leverage ratio as opposed to like a 50 to one at a 2% 2 to, to make up the whole fund size. So I think at the early stages, we have to have more ESOs that are providing those services that are building blended capital, unit economic models that can get to E3 and get to Toyota and get to, I see Invenfin and the crew in the room today too, with the cap table still making sense, with valuation still making sense. And I think we're starting to happen. But I think those ESOs, I mean, I'll stand up here today and preach my own thing, but we, we probably need more funding for things that aren't just CapEx. We need big teams to administer services to startups and not many people want to pay for that. So I think we have to rethink the way that model's built in the early stages to help the 200 million, 300 million dollar fund. Great, I've got, the, I've got the signal, so I'm gonna ask one last question to anyone who's willing to stick their neck out for when we're sitting here in 12 months time. Again, prediction for the next 12 months, one thing you, you think is gonna happen in climate tech over the next 12 months. They didn't know, they didn't know this one was coming, so. <laughs> Honest thoughts. It'll raise more money in Africa than FinTech. I mean, we already talked about that, but that's a big deal. That's a massive deal. It was five to one a couple years ago. Climate tech will raise more capital than FinTech right, in the next policy, 12 months. Climate tech raises more. It's coming. It's happening. Okay. <laughs> I, would, I would say at least one exit, large exit in climate tech in the continent. Certainly welcome that. <laughs> I, I almost don't want to predict anything, but I want to, I want to say like at the end of the 12 months, I want to look back and say who was the who was the investor that I didn't overprice in the sector, right? Because if you look at what happened in FinTech a few years ago, you look at now climate is the big buzz, um, you know, everybody's piling capital into it, there's gonna be an overabundance of capital. So what naturally happens is prices go up and then the VC model gets impacted as a result. So I wanna see in 12 months time, like who is not crying? Um, I think, uh Climate change is the biggest um, problem that humanity faces right now, and we are really feeling the, the impacts. Um, with the drought in, in the southern region of the continent, um, it's kind of a wake-up call. Um, so I see climate tech being a space where the majority of investors will actually want to, to come in. Um, for me, next 12 months, um, we're gonna productionize the insights from climate data. And that's gonna lead us on a path to the $100 million ARR that we're chasing and be one of the early stages to exit. So. Brilliant, well as, as a climate VCI, I hope all of that comes true <laughs> because it's great for the ecosystem. Thank you everyone very much. Thanks, and, Andrew. Uh, Thank yeah, you. back over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you to you all. Um, you can all. Andrew, I'm gonna steal you because you didn't answer that question. So in the next 12 months, 
Where do you see? You see, you didn't answer. It was going to run away to the flights. Yeah, I, <laughs> so. the next four months, I hope to make my flights. So. Okay, no, oh, really? Oh, okay, well, there you go. We're going to have to find him a bit later. But thank you to everyone on panel. Thank you for your next 12 months. Thank you, Andrew. We hope you catch your flights. It'll be good. This is probably my favorite panel because I am in climate, so definitely to more of that. Andrew, fly well. Offset your carbon emissions.